Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. It's your host, Jen Fake, and I'm back. Not that you've noticed I've been gone because I never take a week off. You may notice my voice sounds a little nasty. Um, I haven't been able to talk too well for the last three weeks, and I haven't done any recordings. But today we're going to just do it. And back again with us is Dr. Christopher Howard. He's been on like, I don't know, six or seven times now. You're the most, you're the most regular. <laughs> and we are going to be talking about normal age-related changes in the brain. It's kind of inspired a little bit about the, the previous presidential election prior to the date today, which is August 18th. So thanks for coming back, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for suggesting this. It's not a topic either of us have discussed before. So why don't you catch up any new listeners as to who you are and what you're doing? I think you changed jobs since the last time we talked. It's been a while. <laughs> no, it has been a while. So, yeah. So uh, actually, I feel like I'm a person of many jobs. So I'm still working full time at Thompson Memory Retention in um, Barrington, Illinois. Uh, I started like a little practice. Uh, C.L. Howard, Memory and Rehabilitation in Chicago. So one of the things I wanted to do with the practice was, you know, because one of the things I always preach, I think like one of our first interviews centered on like, how do we get neuropsych into the community? So one of the things that I did was just open up a practice in the south side of Chicago where I can offer services to individuals who might not normally have it. Um, so I'm also doing some work in Detroit, Michigan. Um, so I'm just kind of all over the place, just trying to live the life that I sing about. So, I mean, it's been really good. It's been somewhat of a balancing act, but, you know, just an opportunity just to really help individuals and like provide services like neuropsychological services to individuals who may not otherwise have it has been like very, very excellent, very extraordinary. That's awesome. So I forgot to mention, um, Dr. Howard is a neuropsychologist, which I don't think I ever get spelled right the first time. <laughs> so where shall we start? Should we just start with what normal aging in the brain looks like versus what might be something concerning? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's fascinating because like a lot of times when I have patients that come in, they ask like, hey, you know what? I think there's something that's happening and stuff. So one of the things that we have to do is just kind of discern between, okay, is this normal aging or is this something that's going on? So what I tend to do is just ask like a series of questions and saying, is this consistent? Like, are you forgetting like just people's names um, when you're busy or when you're tired or when you have something going on? Or is this something that's just consistently happening? Like, do you have like the tip of the tongue effect, right? All the things that you kind of look at is saying like, okay, like how was your vascular health? And I'm a huge component, like a vascular health. Like when you think about, you know, diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, arrhythmia, anything that affects the heart pretty much affects the brain. So it's like, do you have vascular disease in any capacity? And if you do, like, is it under control? And I think that's a big thing though also, because a lot of times with vascular health, it's like, you don't necessarily feel it. Like if I dump my toe, then I can feel how painful that is, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. if uh, um, I fall off my bike, I can feel how painful it is. I'm like, hey, my lower back hurts, whatever the case may be. But if I'm hypertensive or if I'm diabetic, that's something that you don't necessarily feel. But what does feel it is your brain. And a lot of times we just see it from a, cognitive, a neurocognitive uh, perspective. So these are just things that, you know, we kind of look at. I think it's important to know, and I always tell this little anecdote to my patients, like, do you remember when Michael Jordan used to play basketball and he used to do like the high flying dunks, the backwards dunks and everything of the sort at 60 plus, he can't do it now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's some impairment that's going on. It's just the natural progression of aging. And that's the same with the brain is that sometimes we can't do the things that we used to do. And we don't realize like how busy we were or how stressed we are. We were and that we were able to do these things. And now we don't have the same level of compensatory strategies now our brain is getting a little bit older and we can't do the things that we used to do from yesteryear, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's necessarily an impairment. It just means I'll, that we're getting older. I always kind of compare an aging brain as similar to an aging computer. You know, you've got maybe a computer that's seven, 10 years old. I have Macs, so they do last that long. <laughs> 
and you know it fires up it can you know you can read your emails you can you know surf the internet but you know like right now i've got zoom running i've got i'm trying to stream to youtube that doesn't seem to be working and i've got GarageBand running and this computer is about four years old you know when it's eight or ten years old it may not be able to do all of these things simultaneously um because it's just an old processor and that's kind of how i relate to our brains it's like you know you might remember things it might just take a little bit longer um i am terrible with names but you know so that's not a new thing <laughs> that's definitely not a new thing but you know it's just i like to compare it to a computer because that seems to be something everybody can kind of understand so i'll let you guys know when the when the computer i have doesn't do all the all the high-tech uh apps for me <laughs> okay i'm sorry mom we're live i'm wearing it Yeah, Christopher's but, been helping his mom today. So, and but I know you guys went and saw a football game too. <laughs> yeah, we did. My mom doesn't always pick up on social skills, <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, no, 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 no. I definitely agree. Like you know, sometimes just like you know, and this is why I think this is why it's so important that you we take care of our brain. Like we find ways to do like different things, right? Because one of the things I always preach is that the best medicine is like early intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So, but like I hate to say like early intervention because not everybody knows what that means. So when we talk about early intervention, it's about creating the foundation of like cognitive stimula cognitive stimulating activities, like you know, having a group of people that you constantly talk to, um, going for walks. I always joke, but I really kind of mean this, is like 15 minutes of exercise kind of dictates the next 15 years of your life, right? Because, you know, you're walking, you're talking, you're doing these different things, and it really strengthens the vascular system, you know. Um, also, like, you know, and I think we discussed this before, like, just kind of like with the mind diet. With the mind diet, um, it just kind of shows, like, you know, if you follow it loosely, it reduces the rate of Alzheimer's by 30%. If you adhere to it, like, it reduces it by 60%. You know that sort of thing. So I think I think there's like certain things that are really good with foundation because as you get older, it's easier to continue to do something versus like okay, I want to start this at 73 and hope for a good result. You know, well, it's better to start it younger. I started my weight loss journey. What was I 45, 44? That sounds about right, about 44, 43, 44. So I wasn't early, early, but it was definitely not as late as now. Um, but now is not that late compared to I'm planning on living as long as my paternal grandmother who lived to 103. And her mind was, her mind was dang fine until about 102, 102 and a half, about 102 and a half. And that's a long, long time. <laughs> um, she was mostly blind from glaucoma. And then at about 101, she got really hard of hearing, which regular listeners know. And that's got to be like almost being like solitary confinement in your own brain. And thank you. No, I'm not particularly interested in that. So um, I, did, <laughs> I did try to watch the volume on things. Um, you know, my eyesight is wacky anyway. It always has been so, <laughs> but I don't have glaucoma. So hopefully that will be not inherited from her. I don't know if that is an inheritable thing, but that's my goal. So now I'm, I went from a certified couch potato who is overweight with a family history of diabetes on my dad's side of the family to somebody who actually kind of starts feeling anxious, not like an anxiety, but just sure. like, uh, you know, like my, it's like pent up energy, I guess, but it, it kind of feels anxiousy like anxiety. If I don't do my workout in the morning, I got to do at least something. Um, the other day, I don't know if it was the weather. We're having gorgeous pre-fall weather here in Northern California. Again, it's August 18th. We're in the mid, like today was actually 82. We're in the mid to upper 80s again for another week. Lovely. And we don't have humidity like you do, so take that. <laughs> but I just totally didn't feel like doing my Peloton routine. Um, part of it's because I'm still recovering from crud. And so I took the uh, sweet Miss Luna paddleboarding Friday morning, which was great out in the sunshine, getting some exercise and the dog was enjoying herself. So, you know, it was there a three-way win. There you go. Yeah, no, I mean, exercise is key. 
And um, and I and I think exercise is like you know just really 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 important just with respect to brain health, um, because you know I don't want to say it's like the panacea, but I think it's like one of the closest things that we'll ever have to like a panacea, like particularly just um, if you want to take like a holistic approach rather than like a pharmaceutical approach. So yeah, so like I think what ends up happening is like when we get stressed, what ends up happening is that we have like a lot of cortisol that just floods our body. Like one of the things you can tell when somebody's stressed, and you see it with people who work like sedentary jobs or they're traveling a lot or flying or whatever the case may be, is because they tend to gain like weight like really, really, really quick and stuff, right? And that's just because their or cortisol is like a steroid. But more than anything, with respect to cognition, uh the brain is the magnet for cortisol, specifically like the frontal lobe. So if we know anything about the frontal lobe, this is where we plan, we organize, we make decisions, everything of the sort. But also it goes towards uh, the temporal or the um, hippocampi. And so with the hippocampi, this is where we keep all our memories and stuff. So a lot of times when people have like a lot of stress and stuff, what ends up happening is that those areas tend to short circuit. And this is when you start to see almost like a manufactured Alzheimer's or if there is a predisposition or susceptibility to it, like now it's kind of being unveiled a little bit sooner than what you anticipate just because you have this rush of cortisol. So like this is why exercise is so important because what it does is that it just kind of helps balance things out and alleviates the influx of cortisol, right? And this is why it's so important that people just get in a habit, kind of like I mentioned a little bit earlier, of exercising, like it's more of a habit than something that you're trying to do like a little bit later. Makes sense. Do you know if when you're ill, um, if that affects the frontal temporal, the hippocampi? Because I swear, and I rarely get sick. I have not been sick since literally I had a 24-hour super creepy bug in January of 2022. So it's like two and a half years ago. It was the last time I was sick. I get sick, just for reference, this is my first and only bout of COVID not mm -hmm. doing this again it wasn't that bad but i'm not doing it again but it just blows my mind at how like i just feel like my brain has slowed down to like mush mm -hmm. i mean not now but like when i first wasn't feeling good and i had no voice it's just like you kind of wander around thinking like well what should i be doing and hmm you know you just kind of like just it just doesn't i'm not i'm totally not my normal you know organized you know just get go to self like it just ugh. It's one of those things where you're like, I just feel like laying on the couch. <laughs> right. yeah, is that, you know, is that, I don't know why illness does that. Is that affecting our brain or is it just because our bodies are fighting off something creepy? Uh, yes and no. So not all illnesses are built the same. So I think that's a big thing. So I think the question becomes is like, why are we ill? Like with somebody coughing and not covering their mouth or sneezing, that's the one type of illness. But another type of illness is like sometimes when we're stressed, the body becomes immunosuppressing or other words, it just stops fighting illnesses. And this is like, cause I'm kind of like the same way. Like there's a period, like I think it was a couple months ago where I just got on Facebook and I was just like, man, I am sick. But it didn't even last. I wasn't coughing or sneezing, whatever. But that was just like a real season of like just being stressed because I was trying to balance so many things. And then your immune, your immune system weakens and what ends up happening is that you just have things that would normally be fought off or normally be ward off. Like now, they just kind of start to proliferate and we get sick, but also it's a way or it's the body's way on us just to relax, right? Um, also like with um oh ooh, almost stopped my computer over. I'm sorry. So also with um COVID, what ends up happening is that we have like these cytokine storms or like we have this inflammation that happens in the brain. And what ends up happening is that it creates like these bouts of confusion, it creates like these bouts of like what's happening and this is what we experience sometimes like when we develop COVID and stuff depending on the severity so you know so I guess the, the overarching question is like not all sicknesses built the same and so yeah that makes sense the only other time I had serious serious brain fog back in 2021 when I got shingles and I would literally walk into a room and be like why did I come in here and then you kind of roam around and like fiddle with the, the tchotchkes on the team and I'm like, oh my God, I'm acting like my mother did. Oh, dear Lord, this is terrifying. And I'm like, I know it's because I've got this really creepy thing. Um, shingles. Shingles is worse than the COVID that I assume I had. I didn't test. My husband tested positive and I figured, well, pfft. he he was contagious before we knew he was sick. So the, the likelihood of it not being COVID is pretty slim. So 
I, I like to tell people I lost my membership in the no COVID club, which four years later is really a bummer. But yeah, shingles was really bad. And that just, well, that messed with my brain um, because it was in 2021 and where the rash, the shingles rash was, was close to my lung you know, on the left side. And so it felt like it was having a hard time breathing, but I could take a full deep breath and my blood oxygen level was fine. Thank you, Apple Watch. But my doctor still wanted to test for COVID. So by the time I got the um, antiviral, it was pretty much too late for it to do any good. So I had that crap for about four months. Ugh, that was no fun. And it, by the end of the day, my brain was just like, that's it. We're grumpy. We're not rational. It was not fun. <laughs> I'll take the COVID crap over that any day. <laughs> you know, I think you do bring an interesting point, though, right? Because I know we're talking about, like, cognitive aging, brain aging and stuff. And I think there's things that we should be looking out for, like things that we should be vigilant. Here. Yeah, so, you know, and I think this is pertinent, and I think I did this, like, in a previous video, like, way back when, and, like, something on Facebook, but it's about recognizing the changes, though, right? Because we kind of talked about, like, is this normal, is this something atypical, whatever the case may be, but I think something that's helpful is recognizing, like, what does atypical aging look like, right? So, like, something that I like to do, like, just from an anecdotal like, I try to like tell people to do, particularly when we like approach like Christmas, Thanksgiving, is can the loved one, maybe they used to cook or whatever, can they still make quality food? Is it too salty? Is it too bland? Do they need to start using recipes something that they haven't done before? Because what it does is that it reflects like, you know, planning, organization, having the flexibility, that sort of thing, right? So when you start seeing differences with that, then that might give you like a little flag that there's uh, some sort of change that's happening. But also, you know, what about their personality? Like, we look for personality changes. Sometimes it's not always something that's grand, but sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. Maybe they used to be, like, kind of reserved, and now they're more jocular where they make inappropriate jokes, or even if they're telling inappropriate jokes, then they stop the inappropriate jokes if, like, a little kid walks into the room, right? Or something that we look at is hyperorality. And essentially what that is is, like, they eat like they've never eaten before. Like, they're just eating like they're really fat. Or maybe they just eat like a whole bunch of sweets, a whole bunch of carbohydrates and stuff, right? Then we're kind of looking like, okay, is this frontal temporal dementia? Or maybe they have a hard time with expressive and receptive language skills. What I mean by that is that maybe they have something that they wish to articulate, but it doesn't necessarily come out well. And that is like disjointed, it's struggled, it's an effort. Or maybe if you give them instructions, it's not so much that they can't hear, but they can't comprehend what's being said to them right then we're looking like okay is this like primary progressive aphasia or something like these are just like little tidbits that if we can get like an early jump on then maybe we can like create some intervention earlier on um or if we're looking at alzheimer's one of the things that we look at is perhaps that they could do a couple things well but where they struggle is that shortly thereafter they quickly forget like if there's like uh milk on the counter do they remember that there's milk on the counter or are reminders helpful right mm -hmm. um so those are going to look at or you know if it's Lewy body's dementia um do they have like the parkinsonian mass where they kind of have like a flat effect maybe they have a tremor do they have well-formed visual hallucinations right they when they're getting ready to go to sleep when they're getting ready to wake up do they see like these hallucinations do they see things that's not wet, real these things kind of matter because these are the things that kind of let us know that there's some sort of atypical presentation that's happening with respect to their aging. I have a funny story about can they make quality food? So my right. family is notorious. You're going to have to come out here for Thanksgiving one of these days. Notorious for making way too much food. And my mom is not was not the most organized person. But there was one year where, you know, I like dessert and I bit into the pumpkin pie, which obviously is not something you're going to make, you know, pretty much the other 51 weeks of the year. She had forgotten the sugar. And I really? was going to, yeah. And she always used a recipe just to like, you know, double check. Like I can make chocolate chip cookies and I have a like, 
I've altered it a little bit. I add cocoa powder and I do a couple little different things, but I always like have the recipe handy to make sure is it two and a half cups of flour, two and a quarter, it's two and a quarter. And just to kind of like make sure that I've got it right. Cause who the heck wants to go through all that trouble, you know, to have chocolate chip cookies that come out yuck or a pumpkin pie that does not taste like pumpkin pie. <laughs> and sure. I'm trying to remember now, but there were just times and I, I think it was subtle and I, you know, then this is why I counsel caregivers that I talk to to write down unusual incidences so that maybe you can start seeing a pattern. But I remember a, one Thanksgiving where it was just like my mother was jumping up out of the chair. Oh, I forgot this. Oh, I forgot that. Now, again, like, you know, we've got the stuffing, the bake, the mashed potatoes. Um, one of these days we're doing mac and cheese because that just sounds delicious. Um, you know, the green beans, the salad, the this, the cranberry, you know, it's like there's there was one year there was six of us, six of us, and we had like whatever the number it we had half a pie a person. I'm like, that's too much pie. What? But it's because everybody had to have their favorite. So her not remembering that something was missing off the table. It's not like there was like a there was not like an open space on the table where it's like, wait, something's missing. No, it was just it popped into her head. And I wonder, it had to have been the early, early, early signs. Because I don't, I'm pretty sure my daughter was really right. little. Um, but yeah, I just vividly, rem I remember the no sugar pumpkin pie. Because one, I was really looking forward to pumpkin pie. And two, this was the stage of my life. So this was prior to 2006. Um, which we, we knew my mother had Alzheimer's before then. So it was, it might have been the late 90s. Um, this was back in the day where it was like, I was literally going to put sugar on the pumpkin pie so I could enjoy it. And then I, I stopped myself and I'm like, that's just silly. Go eat one of the other pies. <laughs> and every time no, I have pumpkin you know, pie, I wonder about that day. Like, did she, what happened? Like, is was it because she was doing too many things, trying to make too many pies? Or was it the first signs of Alzheimer's? Or it was probably both. Well, you know, I think that's interesting, though, because... A lot of times, like, you know, it's so funny because it's like when you, like, do a diagnosis, like, a lot of times we look for, like, this clear cut. It's got to be this rapid forgetting. It's got to be, okay, maybe it's bachelor. So it's just poor planning, having no flexibility, poor encoding, whatever the case may be, right? But I think sometimes when you look at it more from an ecological model or more, like, I'm looking at it in real time, you can look back and be like, you know what? There was something that's a little bit different, like, and and I get it, like, because like before I became like this doctor, whatever people think that I am, whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, I, I think about my dad and stuff, like before he passed and everything. It's just like certain things that were just so peculiar. But then when you look back and then the things that you know now, it's like you can kind of see like this progressive pattern. But also even before that, like my grandpa, you know, he passed away in 2004. I think he was born in, like, 1921, 1922. So just going through, like, where he couldn't readily go to a doctor because, you know, Jim Crow and whatever the case might be and stuff, you start looking at different things from an ecological matter where my grandpa, like, barber shop, did he argue with people at the barber shop or did he bust at people or did he, whatever the case may be, but I think she was trying to create, like, this line of progression of like, okay, there's something that's happening. Is it becoming consistent? Is it bad? Is it going to get him in trouble? Can he manage the finances? Everything of the sort like that, you know? And, you know, he, but really what I think with his was like probably like a multiple etiology just because, and I, so let me bring it back. So when we say multiple etiology, it just means that there's a confluence of variables where you can't just pinpoint one specific thing to say that, okay, the dementia is related to this. Like, it's just Alzheimer's. No, it could be Alzheimer's. It could also be vascular disease because you can have, like, a mixed dementia where you have both vascular and Alzheimer's, and then maybe you have other variables where you have stressors. Maybe you have emotional dysregulation, and all these things contribute to just the onset of, like, a dementia. Um, so, you know, just kind of looking at that is just like, man, and then, you know, I remember like he gave me some money to get like, like a CD or whatever the case may be, but there's some level of miscommunication and he was just so grumpy and just so irritable. And I'm like, where's this coming? Because this isn't like normal view. But then now that I'm, you know, I guess, well, I am a neuropsychologist. You just kind of see him like, oh, okay. I think he has like a level of frontal temporal dementia just with the, you know, personality change. Then it's probably mixed with Louis bodies, just like with the hallucinations and everything of the sort. So I just, you know, so 
I just always think it's interesting, like, when you kind of look back, you see things that are there that kind of give you, like, a little tip, like, hey, there's something that's not right, there's something that's going on. And that's why I always tell people, you know, if you suspect or you feel, you know, you got this sixth sense that something is off with your loved one, you know, start keeping a journal. You know, today's date, what happened, why you think it's weird. You may see a pattern, you may not. Um, regular listeners will remember, hopefully, the episode with uh, Rebecca Cobb. She is a gal living with Alzheimer's. Um, I think she probably had the fastest diagnosis on the planet. Her Alzheimer's did not present with memory loss. She went to her general mm-hmm. physician, and as typical, they asked. she asked Rebecca if there had been any changes, and she said, well, you know, I used to sleep like four to six hours a night, which is not ideal for our brains, people. Now I'm sleeping like seven to nine or eight. It was or eight to ten. It was it was pretty significant. And um, the other day I got lost going someplace that I've gone to all the time. It's just so weird. I don't know what happened. One time getting lost and changes in her sleep pattern, which I mean, she didn't go from sleeping normal to like 12 hours a night. I mean, it wasn't it would not have registered to me as something to be concerned about and that doctor i swear i wish she had asked but i swear that doctor had a connection to alzheimer's a personal one because she sent rebecca right to the neurologist and being but a boom bad bad news and she's done all the lifestyle changes to um you know slow down the progression so she was when we recorded she was five years into the disease and that was in march of 24 and I don't think if you watch the YouTube video or listen to her, I don't think you would know she had Alzheimer's. It's, it was amazing. And, you know, she notices changes, obviously. But, yeah, not all dementias present with memory loss, which I don't think people really get. Because I think they think dementia is just memory loss. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, because you get so many people confuse, like, they think Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's kind of like Alzheimer's under the umbrella of dementia. And you have like different types of dementia. You know, it's something that's kind of interesting though too is uh, removing stress, right? Because, um, and I'm not going to turn this into a biology lesson, but <laughs> stress is that it makes the body immunosuppressing and stuff, and like a lot of the gunk that we look at, you know, what I mean, like the MOE beta and everything of the sort, it just gives an opportunity to proliferate because the body becomes immunosuppressant. But also, it just kind of activates uh, this protein. I believe it's a protein, TDP43. So what's interesting is TDP, TDP 43 is what you find in the football players that have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So individuals who are under like a lot of stress, they have that same TDP 43 activated. And it's almost like they develop their own level of CTE, but without playing like the pugilistic sports like hockey or boxing or football. So I think that's kind of interesting. The only reason that really kind of like put that on my radar was... I was doing some work or I do work in Detroit and I just say that to say is that like periodically like you get people who are Hispanic African-American and usually Alzheimer's comes around when an individual is like 65 ish right give or take a couple years but usually it's around 65 but like some of my patients they would be like 57 and they would have like the neurocognitive profile of someone that was like 70 and the the way that you would talk is like, you know, you try to see what resources and like if they have a high level of independence then you just say mild neurocognitive disorder, whatever the case may be, but they're like dependent on somebody else to be like, okay, major, whatever the case may be, but it would become a, like somewhat of a conundrum because really you should probably be a little bit closer to major, but because you don't have a support system, you're your own person, whatever the case may be, it kind of get pushed back to mild and it kind of perpetuates this whole level of stressors because you don't have a soft space to land. And so you would just see like a number of people where the onset would be so much earlier. And one of the things that you realize or one of the things that people should know is that if you have an early onset diagnosis of dementia, whatever the case it may be, it tends to be like a little bit more aggressive, right? Versus like if I get it at 65, if I get at 72, 73, it's like the older you get diagnosed, the better the prognosis. Not so much that you can return to like a normal level of functioning. It just usually means that it's a higher chance that it's going to uh, maybe plateau or it's going to be like a slow march, right? But like when it's earlier, a lot of times it just tends to be like a little bit faster, a little bit more aggressive. And that's like a lot of things that I saw in like some of my patients when I was in um, Detroit. 
That's interesting because my mom was 69. Let me do the math. She was formally <laughs> diagnosed. Um, she was 68 in uh, 2011. At that point, it was like, duh, tell us something we don't know. So I am pretty sure she started showing showing signs at like 53. Um, but sh so if you go from when I, you know, she died in 2020, I, I knew for sure she had Alzheimer's before 2005 when they retired. So I, I, I'm always interested because one, people will tell you, well, people die with Alzheimer's, but not from Alzheimer's. Like, no, sorry. My mom died from Alzheimer's, and I made sure her death certificate reflected that, and it did. She died uh, I mean, from lack of eating uh, and drinking due to advanced Alzheimer's. Um, but, but I think my mom's Alzheimer's slash dementia was pro perhaps triggered by a car accident where she hit her face so hard on the steering wheel, it damaged the nerve that comes through your cheek. So if you touch your cheekbone where you put your blush or your highlighter, um, that nerve was dead for a long time and she didn't have the best diet she didn't exercise <laughs> she ate a lot of sweets <laughs> except for that one pumpkin pie is do you think that's can can an accident like that oh, absolutely yeah. like okay something that you see like and we see like and we see a little bit or we have seen it like just with respect to COVID and stuff is like sometimes people have like a predisposition or like maybe it was already going to happen but then there's some sort of traumatic event or whatever. And what it does is that it just accelerates everything. Um, so, like, you know, when you think about somebody that's maybe had an aneurysm earlier before, it's still an assault to her brain. Like, even if they fix it, even if they do whatever the case may be, that it still just increases the likelihood that if you're going to develop it, that it's going to happen and stuff, you know. And a lot of times it just kind of accelerates it because the brain isn't necessarily as plastic as it used to be, like when you're five or 10, 15 or 20. But also lifestyle changes matter, you know. It's one of those things where it's just kind of like, okay, well, you know what? You're not really taking care of yourself. And after a while, the same way, like, all the injuries add up on the athlete, all the assaults on the brain kind of add up also. And I think it's kind of interesting. I kind of harp on this a little bit. But when I see patients, you know, and particularly like maybe they were particularly with women, because I did that study like a couple of years ago. So I talked to Rush University, you know, their Alzheimer's clinic. So I talked to Dr. Rosh, uh, so I talked to Dr. Lisa Bars because they are fabulous, fantastic people. Um, even shout out to Dr. Monica Parker and Emory because she's amazing too. So that to say was that when I got published. Like we looked at John Henryism and individuals who ascribed to John Henryism, it was correlated with their cognitive performance. But where it was correlated at kind of goes back to what I was talking about, just like with the levels of cortisol, uh, because we saw like dysregulation um, and like, you know, planning, organizing neuropsychological tests and semantic memory tests. Right. Just right where that frontal lobe is, right where the hippocampi is, like just Right on site. But when we stratified it by gender, what we found is that it was mostly African-American women who were most susceptible to the negative effects of John Henryism. So when I get patients and I ask them, particularly like if they're like, you know, career women, and this isn't so I don't want to like speak in absolutisms or this is like across the board or anything like this. But this is a pattern that I've noticed. Right. Thus far is that when they're like the first of few, the only, and everything that it encompasses being like a career woman or whatever, like it's a level of trauma, even if we don't recognize it and stuff. And a lot of times they're the individuals that develop like the mixed dimension. So this is anecdotal. So this isn't something that you necessarily want to find in Google Scholar or whatever, but this is something that I've seen. So one of the things, a couple of things. So one of the things I try to do is when I do my community outreach, I try to create programs so people understand how to disabuse high levels of stress, or at least do they recognize that they have high levels of stress because individuals who are stressed, what ends up happening is that it makes the body immunosuppressant for longer. So, because I was about to go off on another another diatribe, but <laughs> it, it leads to like a lot of times this level of like mixed dementia, this is where you get like everything of the sort, you know? And also kind of going back to what my grandpa and when my grandma used to talk to, like, the Miss Adeline, who used to cut his hair, and I think Miss Adeline's still alive. She's, like, 99, and she still cuts his hair in Oof. South Bend, Indiana. 
that's fantastic, you know. But I said that to say is that, like, when you reach out to the pastors in the community, you reach out to individuals who do barbershop, when you reach out to all these individuals who have eyes on loved ones, like, it kind of creates, like, okay, like, this is a progression of change. Or, okay, maybe they're doing okay and stuff like that. And this is why I always try to promote community neuropsychology because of other individuals in the community know what, you know, atypical cognitive aging looks like, then it's a step in early intervention versus like nobody knows anything. Then all of a sudden the loved one is, you know, debilitated. That makes sense. I'm in the cycling group and we finished up a ride one morning and one of the gals, I don't, I don't think she even knew what I did do. And she said, we think so-and-so over here, this other gal has early all Alzheimer's, which of course, you know, <laughs> that's right up my alley. And so I asked her why she thought that because the gal that she was talking about would ride ahead of us, you know, stay on the, at least if she, if she didn't stay on the planned route, she ended up back at the, the meetup place without like, you know, a panicked phone call to somebody or anything. And I didn't see any um, indications of that, but I asked her what she saw and I didn't get it. I haven't had a chance to revisit with her because um, I'm not so sure that that diagnosis, that armchair diagnosis is correct yet, but I want to keep like, like an eye on her with that in mind, because obviously these people know her better than I do. But I think it's just interesting because thankfully the stigma is being reduced. And so people like my mom tried to hide it. And my you, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure regular listeners remember that my grandmother also had vascular dementia from an aneurysm that leaked for three months. And my maternal great grandmother had dementia. So this is why brain health is my daily, daily thought processes because I'm not going there. And um my mom was just it was like you cannot hide this lady it's obvious but she right. she tried really hard to hide it and i think that made things worse because she's stressed but you know it's it's much better you know like before we were recording i was telling christopher i drive two hours to get my hair cut because i've been going to the same gal for like 25 26 years and she's obviously gonna know i mean she's seen me she started cutting my hair when my daughter was five and now my daughter's almost 33. So she's seen my whole like adult life transpire. She saw my mom go through the whole thing with Alzheimer's. So it's, I agree with you. I think it's really important to get rid of the stigma so that if you say you were a barber and you noticed, you know, Tom over here, has been coming to you for 10 years and yes, you know, it was never late before. Now he's late or he comes in, he's a little disheveled or just changes you know, you're going to notice it before the doctor will or before some random family member that lives out of town or out of state will. So, yeah, I totally think that kind of community mental health support is so important. It is. And I, I think also, particularly like when you're in an underserved community, uh, because like in Chicago, right, like, you know, north side, neuropsychologists abound, right? You go out to the suburbs, uh, neuropsychologists abound, right? Like it's a dime a dozen, whatever. But when you go to like the west side or the south side of the city, it's not so much. And this is why I always applaud Dr. Barnes and the things that she does. Um, because one, she creates an opportunity for there to be pamphlets, but she often creates a discussion. Like when I was doing, like when I was really on top of my like community outreach in um, Chicago and everything of the sort like that, like people will be wrapped around the podium because they have questions, but there's not many places places of people that they can really go to, right? So I think the next thing is establishing a pipeline to say, okay, well, you know what? And Mr. Henry, Mr. James Doe, Mr. whomever the case may be, or even the barbers or the beauty salons, whatever the case may be, it becomes one of those things where it's like, okay, I noticed something. Who can I call to get you into a program, right? Because if there's nothing in the community and you have to take two trains and a bus or two buses on a train to go and do like a six-hour test then take another two trains and a bus back home or another two buses on the train only to seemingly tell you that you tell you something that you think that you already know well that's kind of problematic because it's like a miscommunication so what needs to happen is that it's like okay well not only are you getting diagnosed or whatever but here's the number of interventions that's in your community that you can do because you may never be able to eradicate alzheimer's but perhaps you can ameliorate the symptoms 
by, you know, being part of programming where, um, you know, you have walking groups or you have like therapy for with a geriatric psychiatrist or geriatric psychologist, you know, different things of the sort, or then, or maybe you have access to medication like uh, cognitive enhancing medication, which is medication that you can take that kind of like reduces the symptoms and that way you can get your um, power of attorney together, you, you can get your will together and different things of the sort like that, right? And also one of the cool things about neuro is that when you get this uh, report, what it does, and you know, sometimes it's jokingly called the golden ticket, because if I say I have memory problems, but I don't have a professional opinion or there's no evidence that I have it, why would I get like, you know, leverage towards research when somebody already has it so once you kind of get like this evaluation what it does is that it just puts you an opportunity just to get access to resources a lot of times there's a paucity of resources and it's a waiting list like if you want to do like assisted living um it might be like a six month waiting list then i know at certain places there's a year waiting list just to get tested so that might be 18 months before you have access to something. Do you know how quickly Alzheimer's or any varying form of dementia can progress in 18 months? Oh, yes. Yeah, so and, you know. and things can happen. You know, if you're struggling with everyday activities and you got to wait 18 months, oof, you know, it just you're adding to the stress that your brain is under. And as I always say, stress is toxic for our brain. So stop that. <laughs> like, Easier said than that's done. Probably one of the that's one of the most toxic things to remember. I mean, there's other things that are actually toxic, but like one of the things that maybe we can control, just kind of modify, is just toxic, you know? And we got to do things every day to unwind. I like to, I don't do them often enough because you got to do them right before bed. Is um, evening stretches wind your whole body down for, and prepare it for sleep. And I've learned with the stretches I've done brush your teeth, wash your face, turn the bed covers down. Because when you've done with that stretch, you're just going to want to plop right onto the pillows and go to sleep. But then there's other things like hobbies, you know, socializing. Um, we don't want to watch too much TV. I don't know. I've heard yes, both it, reading and <laughs> reading is good for your brain, and it's not necessarily good. That like it's not bad for your brain, but it's not necessarily beneficial. So I don't know where you fall on that one. I mean, so like it's, your brain is kind of. Not necessarily muscle, but it's kind of like a muscle, just in the sense that if you don't use it, you lose it. You know what I mean? So reading is good, but reading is good for a number of reasons, though, also, because what it does is that it shows, can you follow the story? Can you follow the arc of, you know, the episode or like, not the episode, but whatever the story is about? Can you follow it? Can you keep track of the different characters? Can you follow the nuances and stuff? Because one of the questions we ask is is the individual still reading right because is it that you can no longer read because you're having some sort of neural anatomical changes that you know and like disables you from reading or is it because you're no longer interested because you can't follow it or is it one of those things that you used to enjoy but you no longer do it and are you having some varying form of depression right because now depression is like built the same like sometimes i'm depressed because after living in my house for three years i have to live into a living facility or maybe i'm depressed because the kids are moving out the home or maybe i'm depressed because i have this history of vascular disease and i'm developing vascular depression because of this vascular depression even if i take like antidepressants whatever the case might be it doesn't necessarily like you know quell my symptoms of depression right because it's vascular native and it's not psychogenic this is why like reading and having hobbies are important because it just lets us know like okay like is there something that's happening right now? You know, it, it's, it's not the what, but it's the why. Like, okay, the what is you don't like to do something anymore. The why is do your joints hurt? Are you disorganized? Are you, can you no longer read? Like, are you have a lack of motivation? Then we can like go do a deep dive and be like, okay, this is why or whatever the case may be. So, I mean, I'm an advocate for individuals to read or at least to have hobbies because it kind of sets a litmus test based on like, their activities can you still do it and do you still enjoy it that makes sense so rapid mm -hmm. fire what should we do as we age to reduce our um risk factors for any kind of dementia okay great question uh three big things particularly if you're going to holistic route right diet exercise sleep 
right? Sleep is where, where the brain cleans itself. You know, diet is what affects the heart, affects the brain. Um, exercise, what affects the heart, affects the brain. Those are going to be some of your biggest components. And something just to think about is 15 minutes of exercise dictates the next 15 years of your life. So if you do an hour a day, does that dictate the next 60 years of my life? Well, one way to find out. Well, I don't think I got 60 years. I, um, what I got 40, 46, uh, 45, 45, almost little, little, little more than 45 to go to get to 103. Lord, that's a long time. <laughs> Every time I think about it in terms of that, it's like, oh dear God, I'm tired already. But yeah, no, I, um, did, we went out exploring this morning, the hubby and I, and I didn't do my workout and Miss Luna didn't get her WALK. She's over here, so I don't want to actually verbalize that. So we are going to do a WALK after we have dinner because we both need it. Because she go. will be 10 on Tuesday and we intend to keep her for as long as possible. So, yeah, I like I said, if I don't do my workout, I kind of just get twitchy feeling unless, you know, like now I'm still recuperating from probably having COVID only time we're going to do this because <laughs> i've determined that once is enough um and the thing i read a lot about loneliness so we definitely need to socialize as much as possible even if we're introverts like i'm so, so, so i'm a borderline I mean, introvert i mean me too I, I have my moments but i mean my only child so i enjoy my company especially like so you know i get it but i was reading an article i was reading an article and it was basically saying like individuals who are part of a church and i'm not like trying to evangelize because you know you can substitute church with sorority fraternity whatever the case may be but they tend to live seven years longer because there's power in just having like fellowship with other individuals and stuff also depending where you live um because i remember i was trying to do this paper and like my my I guess supervisor, I don't know what it was called. Like this was uh yesteryear, but he could not wrap his mind around like the power of community. But he never really grew up in the, like a place of where he had to have community, whatever, because he just kind of grew up like really, really privileged. But one of the things that you find when you do the community work is that you might go to, and again, I'm not trying to like evangelize or anything like that, but you might go to a particular church, and this is where all the elderly go because this is like their social network. So if I give you like research about Alzheimer's, if I give you research about dementia, if I give you research about exercise or frontal temporal dementia, whatever the case may be, because everybody's congregating right here, it's easier to proliferate versus, okay, I got to go to a hospital because depending on what community you live in, you might go to the hospital and there's a paucity of research or there's like lack of research, right? Or there's lack of information or there's lack of resources to actually help you. But like when you have community, you get to aggregate resources. Like it's something that's very small and nuanced, but like when I was just doing research during COVID and stuff, this is how I found, this is like one of the better ways to disseminate information. So it's not necessarily about intelligence or like reading ability, but it's about how do I, you know, aggregate resources. Makes sense. You can, um, you can do two things at once. Join a cycling group and you'll get your exercise and your community all at the same right. time. That's what Absolutely. I do. I mean, oh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's all very, very special. I think it's very, very and I and this is why I think it's so important, like where we kill two birds with one stone. It's where it's kind of like, okay, we'll do a cycling group, but we also recognize that we have older members. And just because I'm abreast to dementia, now if I see something, I know what to do about it, right? Versus mm -hmm. just saying, okay, well no, but what do we do? Right. So this is why I think it's so important that we continue to do things like this because it just helps make people more familiar with dementia. Yep. Well, I definitely going to keep an eye on the one gal who thinks that her friend has early onset Alzheimer's and do what I can in an organic way to help educate them. Because again, I'm not sure her, her diagnosis is correct, but again, I don't know this woman that well um, because she has a tendency to ride ahead of us. And I'm stunned. One of the guys I was riding with yesterday, 70 years old, doesn't look hardly older than 60. It's like, okay, that's me. I won't be like that in another 12 and a quarter years. <laughs> you know, but you got to make sure you wear your sunscreen um, because we don't want to do that either. So this, this has been fantastic.
I'm not going to have a voice much longer. So, and Christopher has to drive back from mom's house in Indianapolis yeah. back to Chicago. So we better let him get on the road. I really appreciate this. I'm going to count up how many times. I think this is either six or seven. <laughs> We're up there. Yeah, that's okay. It's fun. It um, is. I'm, I'm glad we connected. I know you, I see you on social media and it's like, okay, I, I see what he's up to. And that's how I knew you'd open this little practice, but you don't talk about work very much. You like golf and other, other hobbies. Oh, so <laughs> I don't, I don't talk about stress and I went like golfing like earlier today and I'll probably post like a video on Twitter or whatever the case. And it's like, for some reason, I'm just going to hit with my six club. And I'm like, man, like I'm trying to avoid stress. Now I'm becoming more stressed because I can't hit the ball. Like I, like I need to with my six club. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's just kind of funny because, you know, I still active in the community, work, and, like, just really busy and stuff. And it's just kind of like, man, I thought, like, leading into this, when I was, like, a grad student, I was doing all this outreach and visible and present and stuff. I was like, okay, I can take it next to, to the next level now that I got my license and I'm practicing. But now I was like, okay, I got to find a different way of advocacy because, you know, I don't know. Like, it's, it's tough sledding sometimes. Sometimes you're just, like, mentally exhausted, so... I got to take my own advice. Yeah, me too. I think the the COVID got me a little bit harder than it might have because I was mentally and physically exhausted because there's all these things like there's things that need to be done to the house. I got to, you know, plan meals, cook meals, deal with the dog, take care of the podcast, working on a professional speaking career, it's hobbies I want to do. I mean, there's like, if there's not one thing to do right now, there's three other things. And there's things in the evening, I'd be like, oh, I really want to go do my, my little card making hobby or want to go paddleboarding, but oh my God, I'm tired and I don't want to start these things and do, you know, a crappy job or get out on the lake and just be so tired that I got to turn around and come back and, ugh, you know, so I recognize it's like, that was not the right way to deal with things. And, um, I need to shift my evenings a little bit cause I'm scrolling on my phone too much and we know that's not good for our brains. <laughs> Me too. I mean, it's just it's the effortless activity. It gives us a level of respite. I mean, I get it. I, I fall victim to it, too. Like, I'm going to take a look at Facebook, and, like, 20 minutes later, I'm still here scrolling. So, I get <laughs> Well, the weather is not 108 anymore. That was not fun. Um, so, I'll probably start taking the uh, four-legged friend in the evening. Cause, and I go out for, you know, the strolls. I don't think she knows that word. Um, I don't. I used to take my well i take my phone but i used to like listen to a podcast or music or whatever and you're like i was having to stop and pause whatever is listening to to talk to neighbors and even if i go out and i end up not talking to neighbors, i don't i don't do that anymore i just go outside and enjoy the air and the trees and everything and just you know watch the dog do her thing and you know i find it really really fun and just it's it's really relaxing it's you'd think it'd be boring but it's not so i should do that more we gotta let you get on the road i really appreciate yeah, no, this thank you for having me it's definitely been a pleasure and um yeah i look forward to doing this some more okie dokie thanks so much fading memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts